Well, generally, there are very important links between climate change issues and communities. One of them is that traditional people all over the world, essentially, they have adapted to changing environments in different ways. The reason why we have traditional cultures here in the Arab world or anywhere else in the world is because these cultures have already survived climate change and many other uh, changes that have affected their environments and they uh, have adapted to that. So it means that these traditional communities have a lot of knowledge and a lot of cultural practices related to managing the, the environment which are precisely at the basis of their resilience and adaptation capacity. Um, and, and the problem is that today is that uh, very often when climate change negotiators and climate change experts and officials in countries develop their plans, their programs, their strategies and so on, they tend to focus on new things that need to be implemented uh, to counter the effects of climate change mm. or to adapt and so on and so forth. And they rarely think about what their cultures already have that can be useful. And the problem uh, also is that in, in many cases these traditional communities are more exposed than others. You know, people in, in developed societies living in urban uh, environments and so on, they are exposed of course, of course to climate change as well, but maybe less than, for example, coastal communities in islands or in, in deserts and, uh, you know, people living precisely in mm. fragile environments. So the reason why we need to focus on this is vulnerability of the people, but also their own traditional knowledge and practices and capacity to adapt if they are properly supported. Give us an example of how you, of a particular country, I guess, or a, a community um, that you've been working with in, in, in this region that can really help illustrate, if you can, um, how local communities are perhaps using what their historical sort of forefathers have, um, have worked out how they've how they're adapting and dealing with changing conditions well one good example is the management of um, drylands um, arid and semi-arid environments for example by pastoral people uh, Bedouin communities and, yeah. and other traditional people who practice essentially um, um, nomadic lifestyles for for managing these lands mm -hmm. you know mobility of these communities the way the, the, the fact that they move in large landscapes uh, throughout the year, it's because of precisely the climate variations, mm -hmm. is the seasonal variations of the weather. Mm -hmm. So they need they, they need to move from place to place, not to overuse the land, and depending on the availability of pastures and weather. So these mobility is already an adaptation to climate change. Mm -hmm. But they, apart from that, have developed um, a number of different ways of managing these, uh, these areas which are in some cases quite sophisticated and you can find these for example in the north of Africa where are many pastoral communities practicing this lifestyle in places like the Sahel also in Africa but also in many countries in the Middle East uh, where the, there are still Bedouin communities like for example in Jordan and uh, in, in other places um, in, in the region so for example they have a practice that is called HEMA, uh -huh. which is quite an interesting uh, model, an interesting system of managing the lands. It consists that in certain areas which are particularly vulnerable to climate variation and change, uh, but also particularly important for um, provision of water, for pasture lands and, and, and for other resources, uh -huh. they establish quite sophisticated systems of use, a system of regulations uh, managed by the, by custom, by 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 customary institutions and customary uh, principles mm -hmm. that establish exactly, for example, how many animals you can have as as a family, mm -hmm. and what's the composition of the herd that you can have, so that the, there is optimization of the fodder. Mm -hmm. That establishes, um, for example, in time in time in time sorry in in times of um, greater um, scarcity of water. Um, ways of reducing the size of the herd or w ways of using the, the land by cutting, for example, the pasture instead of allowing the animals to go and eat whatever they want. They, mm. It's a system of rationing also for the animals. Mm -hmm. And 
all this is managed by the traditional leaders, the traditional institutions of the community uh, through these traditional principles and, and regulations. Mm -hmm. And all the community all, all obviously respects that, uh, you know, very strictly because survival depends on that. Mm. And uh, they have also a, sy a sophisticated sy system of redistribution of the benefits of these of these areas, particularly in times of scarcity, again, as I said. So in distributing the benefits, they would look, for example, first at those people in the community who are more vulnerable, mm -hmm. like, for example, uh, of, um, families of um, single mothers or, or you know, um, elders uh, mm -hmm. and so on. So it's a system that combines good use of the land, adaptation to the changing conditions of the environment, are, and also a concept of um, social equity uh, within the community. Connected to this is, is another practice that is, has been um, quite common in these areas, but is today disappearing in many places, which is traditional water management. These societies have established for centuries systems that allow them to collect every drop of water mm -hmm. that falls from the sky, collect it and channel it to the underground to avoid evaporation. So they have built sophisticated systems of channels and reservoirs um, underground. Mm -hmm. And then they use, again, the water that they collect um, through a very detailed, uh, regulated system. So mm -hmm. not everyone is allowed to take the water the water, you know, in, in whatever quantity they want. Yep. Every family is allocated what is um, what is feasible and what is needed mm. for their survival. So um, through these systems, of which are many in these societies, mm. it's precisely that these that the Arab cultures have survived for so long in such a difficult environment. Mm. This is the explanation of you know the tremendous resilience of the Arab cultures. I guess my final question would be, um, those are all really good examples of how, uh, I guess, traditional and indigenous um, knowledge can, can help people adapt to changing conditions. But as the world's population increases and as we, I guess, we all, uh, people strive to, to have cars and houses and everything else, is there any way that those traditions can survive? Because I guess if you're a nomad, sooner or later someone's going to build on one of your pastures and you know is 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 there any future in that lifestyle well that's that's a very good question and and, and there is no easy answer to that in, indeed there is greater competition for land greater competition for resources and also unfortunately we fear that the impacts of climate change are going to be bigger than before mm. so the challenge is bigger as well um, I still believe that there is a place for these traditional knowledge and practices and cultures uh, that they need, on the one hand, uh, support, and they also need a combination of different measures. Yeah. What, what shouldn't happen is, is, is to erase all these traditional cultures and replace with modern um, approaches or technologies, because people will suffer a lot from that they are suffering a lot already in some places because of the changes that they have experienced apart from climate changes from their own government um, and so if there is no um, support and recognition and, and, and respect for the value of these traditional systems uh, they will be more exposed definitely to, to climate change and to other social economic and cultural changes mm -hmm. so i think there is a good a good way to go with, through a combination of both. Mm. I think we need to understand better what, what has still potential from these cultures and what doesn't because not everything will survive. And that's the way humanity has changed, you know, all, all throughout its, its history. So some things are, um, are, are changed by, are replaced by others and, and the same will happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I said, combination of approaches, combination of different knowledge systems, combination of different practices, and of course innovation is absolutely needed. Mm. In many cases, uh, because of competition, greater competition for land, um, the nomadic culture will no longer be able to maintain itself mm -hmm. in the same conditions. But still, some of the principles of rotational use of the land 
are completely valid uh -huh. and, and, and will have to continue to be implemented somehow, even if it, if, if it is under improved uh, conditions. Uh, you know, in relation to traditional water management, <coughs> one of the problems that these communities are experiencing, for example, in the north of Africa, in, in, in Morocco, in Tunisia, in Egypt, is that um, in the places where there is some water, like in the oasis, for example, mm -hmm. the governments have come with the wrong understanding yeah. that since there is water there, we can use it to build commercial agriculture. Yeah, yeah. And they have replaced the traditional system of the oasis uh, with um, commercial crops. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the, the result has been depletion of the underground water of the oasis. And some of them are completely dead today because of overuse of the water. So this cannot happen uh, because you cannot create water. Mm. You can manage water in a better way, but you cannot create it uh, out, of, of, out, out of the air. Mm. That's, that's reality. So going back to some of the traditional ways of administering the water mm -hmm. for these communities would be very beneficial, but still with innovations that allow for optimization of use. Um, and, and there are many very mm -hmm. good techniques, actually, for optimizing the use of water mm -hmm. in this arid environment. So mm -hmm. if you combine both sources of knowledge and practice and innovation and technology, you will get better results than by just ignoring <coughs> what traditional cultures have been able to do for so long.